Thank you. It's really wonderful to be here. And of course, for Child Protection Week, it's um, even more special, really, isn't it? That we can really shine the light on how everybody is responsible for looking after children. And uh, uh, as Marge said, this um, study I'm going to talk to you about, I think, really will be of great interest to you in the sort of work that you're doing. And I hope that... Um, when you hear the rest of it, that you'll be finding all the 10 and 18-year-olds you have in your life to participate in the next stage of the study, which is um, having a say on safety. Okay, so as we've said, this um, uh, project was commissioned by the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to ch sexual, uh, Child Sexual Abuse. It's not a very catchy name, is it? And uh, certainly what we've been seeing on the news every night would imply that institutional failures in protecting children has been widespread, significant and continues. So the Royal Commission uh, has a range of um, terms of reference, obviously, and one, the first one really is to try and understand, sometimes historically, sometimes longer ago than we think that would ever still happen, but historically to find out what are those institutional failures that allow people in their 50s and 60s to talk about what happened to them with seemingly no proper institutional response. So there was an argument that, um, in fact, it was really critical to hear people's stories about institutional failure. And, in fact, there's also an argument that one should maybe potentially talk to children and young people who've experienced sexual abuse. But they were also very, very keen to talk to a broader group of children, children who are in, have um, interactions with all sorts of institutions to find out what they think and how they actually conceptualise and experience safety in the institutions that they interact with. So uh, the Royal Commission, in fact the Chief Royal Commissioner, Justice McClelland, he keeps going to places and saying, oh this children's study, this is the most important study that we have commissioned. And I always feel a bit unwell when he says that because you know that it's going to get quite a lot of attention. So it's very, very important that people his, uh, where historic, historical abuse has occurred, that their stories are heard and that is you know, built into sort of preventative strategies. But it is also really important in thinking about the future focus for keeping children safe is to hear children now who may or may not have necessarily been involved in anything um, of a sexual abuse nature. So the Royal Commission um, has a real opportunity with quite a large research agenda budget to leave a, an important legacy of research. Now, I don't know whether anyone's surprised about this, but there has been no prevalence study in Australia to tell us the extent and nature of child abuse, sexual abuse generally, but child maltreatment more, um, more specifically. So they, this is a real opportunity with the Royal Commission to leave some foundational gaps filled and I think our study is also doing that as well. Now in this audience I don't know that I need to tell you why we need to talk to children but I spoke at the Grand Rounds this morning and I thought it was actually really important to think about well we're all on the same page about how important it is to talk to children but let's not assume that all people might think that it's worthwhile. And our study is very much framed by a view that's emerged over the last 30 years that argues that children have agency, they have influence, and they are able to interact in a world that we need to understand in a more effective way. So in terms of research, they make very excellent research participants because adults have been trying to respond to children's needs in all sorts of ways, sometimes effectively, sometimes not. So this theoretical perspective really fits in with the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child that argues that children have the right to express their views freely in all matters that affect them. Not just in formal things like in the child protection system, but for example in consulting with them about what a paediatric ward might look like and that being implemented in a way that's effective. So this study really is um, underpinned with the idea that children have different standpoints to adults, that they understand the world in a different way. And what's also very helpful in this study is they can also tell us what they think adults think. It's really very interesting. They've got all sorts of theories about why adults do the things that they do. So this study attempts to find out what they think about safety and, and uh, safety in the context of institutions. But children definitely have different concerns and different ways of exploring and understanding experiences and I think it really is important if we don't talk to children we're never really going to get a proper idea about their needs and wishes and be able to respond to them effectively. And certainly I don't know whether people are surprised to hear this 
I've been in this job for 11 years at the Institute of Child Protection Studies and we've done a lot of studies with children about sensitive issues like homelessness, living in families with um, drug and alcohol issues and there are just so many gaps. And although there had been studies with children about safety in the environment or at school, no one had actually said, well, what do you mean by safety? We actually had to go to a very you know, foundational set of knowledge to understand why children um, think the way they do. So what did the children in our study say about why we should talk to them? Well, here's a couple of examples that I think encapsulate how children might see the world. So adults think they know what kids need to be safe, but I don't think that they do. They base it on what they remember from, what they, from when they were kids, and the world is different now. So they need to talk to kids to find out what it means to them. And this was a very strong theme that kids said the world, they're so aware that the world is so different to what it was when their parents were children themselves. So even in an attempt to remember what it was like when we were children, and some of us it's a lot longer than for others, it's a really important thing that you, in fact, um, children are aware that it's a different world. In terms of safety, kids are quite aware that the, that the world is unsafe. Well, that's how they feel anyway. So if you're going to make it safe, you've got to make them feel OK and you have to ask them what worries them and fix that. So not making assumptions about what children think are very important. So what did we do? Well, we, it's quite a big study and what I'm reporting on is the first stage of the study. Um, we had, um, uh, because we've, in all of our studies, we try to have a children and young people's reference group. We're very committed to not coming in with the with the problem and then saying to kids oh this is what we're going to do but to wherever possible have groups of kids help us to conceptualise the issue and if Tim Moore was here my colleague who is, was the um, uh, project manager on this job he would have you dancing to the song Happy and he would be getting your attention because kids said you have to get their attention first before you can talk about some of these issues. So we had three reference groups, um, the kids who were between 8 and 10, um, kids who were between uh, 14 and 15 and some kids from a, um, uh, a program in a school, a sort of engagement program in a school um, who had a, a, a different sort of perspective. So we had three, three reference groups who helped us frame what we did. And then we spoke to over 120 kids and young people who were aged between 4 and 14 throughout mainly the East Coast, Queensland, Victoria, New South Wales, the ACT. We didn't go any further west than that uh, but because of the constraints. But we talked to kids in the sorts of institutions that kids interact with and that are defined in the terms of reference for the Royal Commission. And we defined institutions where ad other adults have responsibility for the care of children. So it could be the, you know, the swimming club or the football club. So we talked to kids in early childhood centres, and I say we, the royal we. A colleague of mine who's an early career researcher, not only, no, that's the wrong term, an early childhood researcher, she um, spent time in a childcare centre and spoke to four and five-year-olds over a month um, talking to them about safety. They're very, very worried about cars. They'd had someone come in and talk about you know, road safety and they were very, very focused on that. In fact, you'll hear later that there's all sorts of things they're worried about, but anyway, cars particularly. We also talked to kids in different parts of schools, like boarding schools, high schools, primary schools. We talked to um, young carers who go on camp, you know, who go um, on a whole range of camps. Young people with disability, Aboriginal students in, a, in a, uh, an Aboriginal school in Queensland, and young people in the out-of-home care system. Now, as you can see from that list, um, kids with disabilities and kids in the out-of-home care um, system really are... Um, have a different experience to your run-of-the-mill kid who goes to school. And so one of the arguments we made for the Royal Commission was to say that kids with particularly profound disabilities and kids in um, uh, foster care and in residential care particularly are more vulnerable to the sorts of safety issues. And so the Royal Commission has in fact commissioned two further nested studies. One uh, run by the um, Southern Cross University where she's spoken to uh, Sally Robinson has spoken to kids with quite profound disabilities and their carers and we are just about to start a nested study talking to young people in residential care because we think the context is really quite different. What did we ask them? Well, we started from the basics about what does safe and unsafe mean. We wanted to know about, you know, where are the places where they feel safe or unsafe and uh, how well are adults going and keeping them safe? What's their view about all of that? 
and what else needs to be done to do it better. And so although this wasn't an evaluation of preventative programs or anything like that, most kids, for your interest, did talk about doing protective behaviour. They were aware of protective behaviours uh, training. In fact, some of the older ones said they needed to do it more frequently, you know, that they'd done it as young kids and maybe they needed to do it again. Now, we... Does any, some people would know my colleague Tim Moore. Um, he's a very creative researcher. He was a youth worker and I think he still you know, misses that a lot really. <laughs> and we had two sessions um, with all of the kids in our focus group. So a session for about two hours where we really tried to engage kids in these conversations. But getting to know you activities were really important. Um, we talked about the rights that they had in doing research, like what was research and what could we say about what was said in the, in the session, what were their rights to participate or not participate. They had stop and go cards, so if there were issues they didn't want to talk about, they didn't have to say it, they could just put their stop card in front of them. And we also um, used the conceptual mapping tool, which all of you would be aware of, to think about what safe and unsafe would look like. And um, we had these worry graphs I, we've got someone who's actually analysing these worry graphs. We've got about 45 pieces of butcher's paper with yellow stick, well, not always yellow, little, um, you know, it's post-it notes where kids have put what they're worried about, how likely is it to happen and what's the impact. So they've actually been asked to, to put those um, issues on these worry graphs. The action grids um, were really about honing down some of the key issues for the Royal Commission, and I'll tell you what those are, but it was really an attempt to say to kids, all right, what are the key issues? Um, what do children and young people need if this uh, event occurs to them? What are adults currently doing? What could they do better? Um, and then, of course, checking out, because most kids, um, I must say, over the 120, apart from the kids in the out-of-home care sector who were, you know, clearly talking about experiences that were right up the continuum in terms of being unsafe, most kids um, were very aware that because this was a project for the Royal Commission, what we were really talking about was child sexual abuse. And so although we didn't start to talk about it, we, you know, entered it, we entered that conversation quite carefully, kids were very aware of it and were able to talk about it. And I'll tell you about some of the things they've said. So we needed to make sure that everybody was still OK in those groups and we used kamochis. I don't know whether you've seen them as a practice tool. They're cute little things that have feeling faces on them and kids could pick what, and they were very popular, particularly with the 17-year-olds. They just loved them. And the last thing we did, well, there was two last things, but it was very, very important, we felt, that because some of the things that kids were saying, um, you know, they were because of the consent issues around doing research, we thought it was very respectful to say to kids, there's a whole lot of adults outside this room, teachers, um, coordinators of programs. What would you like us to say when they said, how did it go? So we were able to negotiate with kids about what the key messages were for those adults outside the room who were worried about what might have been said. So that was a really important process, we felt. These are kamochis. They're very cute. Very cute. So it was a very, very interactive um, process. Our research really does try to ensure that children and young people have choice, choice to participate, choice how to participate. And, uh, you know, a lot of these strategies um, were used in a whole range of ways. Kids had choices about what they wanted to do. But the fundamental thing was we, um, the questions that drove the research were answered by each of the, of the focus groups. OK, so the, when asked to map what SAFE felt like, the, there were four really uh, main things and they tended to be around, I think there's five actually, around feelings. So how do you, you know, how do you feel when you feel safe? People who kept you safe, um, activities that you used when you were and you wanted to be safe and things that kept you safe. And um, there's some quotes here from, from children. I feel safe when I'm with my nan because she cares for me and hugs me and has good advice. And one of the key things about feeling safe is that familiarity is really critical. So if people feel safe getting on a bus and going somewhere home from school, for example, if they get on a different bus or as a different bus driver, that causes kids' anxiety and they feel less safe because of the unpredictability about it. So these feelings, people, places and activities, times and things were used over and over to describe safety. 
and they talked a lot about how feeling safe they could feel it in their body and it was more than the absence of feeling unsafe but this physical I mean I think you'd probably all be aware about how children have these feelings about feeling happy and feeling safe but also about when they feel unsafe them actually feeling it in their body and not really being necessarily able to understand why they feel the way they do. And for most children um, and young people, safety was something that they experienced. They differentiated between being safe and feeling safe. They actually felt sometimes that they knew they were safe, but they felt unsafe. And so when, when adults are looking at children and young people and they regard themselves as being in a safe place, feeling safe may not necessarily happen. That children saw it in two quite different but connected ways that being safe and feeling safe were two separate things. So that's a really, I think, something that we need to explore a little bit further. So safe things, things that protect you from harm. Having a phone, a lot of kids felt having a phone was a really important mechanism for feeling safe. And I must say, as a parent, I'm quite convinced that the tracking mechanism in my son's phone is imperative. <laughs> I don't think he knows it's there, but, you know, <laughs> we'll tell him one day. But the having a phone, um, children felt, was a really important thing. Um, this young man in um, at one of the children's groups, these letters after the quote imply that they're maybe the younger children, CH is for children, YP are for young people's groups and mixed is where they were a mix of ages and infants. Um, this little boy said, my dog makes me feel safe. He barks. He's very vicious. He protects the house and he'll sit out in the yard and growl and keep people out. His friend said, he didn't bark at me when I rode past your house yesterday. He said, well, he must have got used to you. Okay, he's not that vicious. But the idea that his dog was there to protect him in a way that was really important, I think, that um, there are these things that make children, um, you know, feel safe. So children did make it clear that just having adults present didn't necessarily mean that they were safe or they felt safe. This idea of really getting to know somebody... Um, and to trust an adult um, and it, that takes time and it didn't necessarily alleviate their fears. So um, this notion of feeling safe um, is quite a, uh, a rich sort of concept for kids that it's experienced in all sorts of ways. Um, safe things, um, apart from the dog, um, were also things that gave them some relief. Um, the dog or the children and young people recognised that sometimes they thought could protect them, like that little boy really thought his dog would protect him, but they might not necessarily have been very helpful. So what about unsafe? Well, unsafe is, of course, um, in the absence of things that are safe. And they tended, too, to be around people's feelings, places, activities. And this idea that you feel this unsafeness in your body was so strong in every one of those focus groups, you can tell you, it's like you're nervous, you can get sweaty, you start to eat a lot. Oh, is that my reason? <laughs> you start to do things quickly and you can't think straight. You start trembling, you act all nervous, you respond badly to something or someone. This idea that you actually feel um, that it's in, in, you know, in your body and you can't always justify it, you can't always explain it, but it's a very strong feeling, these kids said. There was lots of things that um, children and young people identified as being unsafe. Clearly people who, um, who hurt you or wanted to hurt you or who wanted to use your pow their power against you in some way. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Adults who don't act like adults and adults who make you feel weird. And feelings were also important. And some children and young people actually identified positive emotions. So one kid said that, um, he um, thinks that he laughs when he's nervous because um, he hopes someone will come and rescue him. And children's bodies were used to assess whether they felt unsafe. And this advice from a four-year-old, stay away from everything that's dangerous. It's a pretty big category, that one, from a four-year-old. Some participants thought that, in fact, there was um, everything and everyone was unsafe for children and young people until they proved they were safe. There's not a lot of transference of trust um, in the kids talking about this. Um, sometimes um, there is, but it's not, it can't be guaranteed that just because me, um, um, as a parent or a teacher you might say, oh, this is a good person, that that transference of trust will happen immediately. And this issue of power, children and young people were incredibly aware of the power differential between adults and children and young people. And there was a... Um, 
uh, a young woman who had had an unfortunate set of experiences with her piano teacher um, where she felt incredibly uncomfortable and her, she said to her mother, I know you're going to say, why didn't you tell him to stop? And she said, because, you know, I just can't do that because I can't tell adults to stop. The only people I can tell to stop, the only people I can tell anyone to do are the small children, the preppies, the kids in kindergarten. Really aware that, the you know, the pecking order of developmentally, that the only people you can tell to do anything are those younger than you. And the idea that you would tell an older child or um, an adult um, to stop something or to um, is just inconce- was inconceivable to some children. That um, feeling of being disempowered was um, uh, very very strong. So children and young people um, told us that being safe and feeling safe aren't always the same, as I said before. And sometimes they said that when they were feeling unsafe, they felt very alone, that they didn't know what was happening that no one is talking to you. So, for example, you know, there's multiple occasions when something happens to adults and adults make judgments that they don't tell children what's going on. It can happen in a school, it can happen in a care situation. And um, children know there's something going on, but adults make the decision not to tell them. They're pretty aware of that, as you probably know, and um, the idea that no one's talking to them and telling them about what's going on makes them feel very unsafe. I've seen some things that worry me. I just don't actually understand what's going on. And so what do they, how do they tell? How can you tell if you're being safe? Well, they look to see, are there dangers? Children talked about being quite vigilant about in being in public places and being quite vigilant to what was going on, um, you know, around them. Um, are there any dangers? Can they see that the adults look like they're in control or are adults behaving in an unpredictable way? Um, how do you feel? Well, they are feeling. They make a judgment about whether they're feeling safe or unsafe. And one of the things they said was how, for example, if they went to a new school, were other children? How are other children behaving? Were other children looking like they were comfortable and happy and um, getting on with things, or was there something that um, that this new person could see that implied that there might be things they needed to be a little bit observant about? So, how are other kids acting? Are they looking like they're having fun? And what have you heard? Well, um, as you'll hear, a lot of children and young people were very critical of the way the media presents and amplifies particular issues. Um, you know, you can just imagine um, what they're thinking in the last few days about, you know, the refugee situation that we're seeing unfold um, in our lives in, um, in Europe. And what children want to know is, OK, I know the world's unsafe and I know this stuff's happening, but could you also tell me that you adults are doing something about it, like that something is actually going to happen and that this chaos isn't going to continue? So it's about the way that stories are often presented without the solution or without the action that they hear through the media. And from adults you trust. So if adults, you know, they try to do that translation of trust, but it doesn't always work. And from friends, and I should have also put older siblings, because some of the older kids actually started to feel a little bit guilty about some of the things they'd told their younger siblings about what they should be frightened about. (laughs) And they were quite, they realised, of course, that their younger siblings listened to what they said about what was safe and unsafe, and that maybe they probably should go home and say, look, you know, I've told you about the ghost in all the, you know, the um, haunted house. It doesn't really exist. So they were quite aware of that. And certainly for some of the kids in the focus groups, for those kids particularly in the out-of-home care area or young carers, um, what they experienced really gave them a sense about what to experience again. So not surprisingly, if it's happened before, how did it end? Did it end well or with somebody really making sure I was okay or did it not end well? And so, for example, in the um, kids in the out-of-home care focus group, um, and a number of them, not surprisingly, had had very poor experiences as young adults, including sexual assault and rape. And um, they said that the, the system responded to them effectively. The police was called. All of those formal processes happened. But what they experienced after that was, well, that's finished now and we don't really want to talk about that anymore. The adults don't want to talk about it anymore. And they felt like adults didn't want to talk to them about anything because this event had occurred. Now, one doesn't want to overgeneralise that experience because it was only one group, but they felt that the system responded officially but didn't then um, follow up with the sort of human response to what it might be like. So their experiences mean that they may not, um, they may not um, tell adults again. 
So we, when we ask them about the worry meter and what they're all worried about, they ask, they put down, I've never seen so many yellow, st yellow stickies and pink stickies in my life. There was a lot of worry, but they included things like ghosts and monsters and um, failing their driver's licence and or their HSC or, you know, a range of things. And so at that point, we tried to sharpen it down to the sorts of things that the Royal Commission would be particularly interested in, in the sense of what institutions could do to respond to some of those fears. And why is that not working? Oh, there we go. Not surprisingly, uh, one of the things that came up again and again was bullying. Bullying is would appear from the 120 kids we spoke to, which, as you know, is a huge qualitative study, um, including quite young and old kids, that bullying by adults and bullying by other children were really, you know, quite a, um, a serious thing that children felt unsafe about. And bullying by adults, which included for kids um, the favouritism. So, you know, that the, the, the sporting coach who really had some favourites and who excluded, bullied almost by exclusion, kids who weren't the favourites. So bullying was very serious. So being pressured into doing bad things when they didn't want to that had negative consequences and that could be everything from, you know, going out and doing an underage drinking to, you know, um, being bullied into playing rugby when they didn't really want to by a teacher at school. Um, being hurt because adults weren't doing their job or of the institution failing to protect them from external threats, that really is fundamentally, I think, um, about some kids who are in um, residential care. And the two big ones which um, came up in every single group, it didn't, it didn't matter which age they were at, the two things were coming across creepy adults. I think everybody has a, a notion of what a creepy adult is. I was very keen to understand what they meant by what a creepy adult was. And they, the particularly I mean, young women and men, uh, young women and young men, really described a creepy adult in a number of ways, but fundamentally included adults not acting like adults, you know, trying to be too friendly. So be careful workers <laughs> when, you try, when you're working with young people. <laughs> don't try to be too young. Um, the, 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 uh, in fact, I don't think Tim would mind me saying this because he has said it publicly. One of the kids in the focus group said, oh, I thought you were a bit creepy when we started because you were just, you know, you were behaving in a pretty young way and you were showing lots of interest in us and I was a bit worried. But you're not, so it's okay. <laughs> it's a relief, Tim. You're not a creepy adult. That's a relief. But really adults who stand too close, who show too much inappropriate attention, you know, come to my office and let me help you with your homework, um, behaving in ways that children find unpredictable for adults to behave in. Children have got pretty strong views about how adults should behave and they shouldn't be behaving like children. And in fact, one of the groups, um, there was a group of young women at a particular school who talked about this creepy adult thing in quite a lot of detail. And they said that there had been a teacher at school that there were, everybody felt, you know, was a creepy adult. And that actually said something to one of the teachers. And the teachers had said, well, if you haven't got anything more concrete than it makes you feel uncomfortable, I can't really do anything. Now, that's a very common occurrence, I suspect. We can't really... I mean, that's a natural justice thing as well, you know. So it is a balancing act, but unfortunately that teacher was let go a couple of months later when there was a much more stronger um, evidence about um, inappropriate behaviour in the school. So the kids felt like they had... They, they felt they should have been listened to, that they, in fact, were in a good position. That's a tricky thing for in a school context when, it's, when, they're, all, when they're saying they feel uncomfortable. And child abduction, the white van... Over and over again, I have to say. Um, uh, in Queensland, the focus groups, of course, sadly, the um, Daniel Morecambe's killer had been sentenced at about the same time that we were up there. And so kids were really, really aware of what is an incredibly rare occurrence of a child being abducted and murdered. It was right in the front of their mind. And I suppose as adults, we have to try to manage the risk between saying it's a pretty unusual thing to happen, pretty rare. In fact, the Children's Commissioner at the launch of our report last week or the week before said there had been some research that said if you left a child on the corner of a street for 40 years, they still wouldn't be abducted. That's how low the risk is. And yet, um, you know, it is something that is so um, imbued in children's minds about um, stranger danger and about white vans. In fact, one of the um, young people in a group I um, co-facilitated, um, we were talking about, you know, um, the uh, 
uh, child abduction issue and he said, well, you know, if I was a pedo, he said, um, I wouldn't have a white van. I'd have maybe a green one. <laughs> or he said, well, maybe not a van at all. Yes, they just, they, it is quite remarkable how this notion of white van is so em emblematic of the fear that people have about children abdu children's abduction. And that's not to say that if it happens, it's not absolutely hideous, but it is a low risk compared to other things that happen to, happen to children. But they're all very, very aware of this. And um, one of them um, had been watching something on A Current Affair who was actually quite surprised to hear that rates of child abduction had not increased over the last 40 years of data collection as an incident of crime. So they, they were, um, you know, some of them were very tuned into these issues and what it might mean for them. So they were the sort of very serious things that um, most of them um, identified as being unsafe situations for them. So one of the things we asked was how could adults, you know, what could adults do to keep children and young people safe? Um, and what should they do around some of these things? Well, young people were very aware that a lot of the time, children and young people's uh, views and needs are ignored. No one ever asks them what they think or anything like that. And they felt that, that children and young people had a lot to give in all sorts of arenas of life and that in fact that institutions um, really, and adults particularly, needed to respect children and young people, their abilities, their observations and their needs and wishes. Now, you know, we have moved into a policy context where children and young people are consulted in a whole range of ways. Say, for example, in the family relationship area, you know, there's a lot of work done about finding out what children's needs and wishes might be if there's contested arrangements for visitation. Certainly children in the child protection system um, are spoken to at different points with different effectiveness to find out what their needs and wishes might be. But I think this is more a general thing about trying to really respect that children and young people do have abilities, needs and wishes that can be taken into account. The other thing too is about asking children and young people um, about what they're thinking and feeling and what they need. Um, they talked a lot about how circumstances where adults made all sorts of decisions for them, most of them fine with them, but just occasionally it would be nice to say, well, you know, what do you think we should do? They also thought that adults needed to be watching other adults. I know it sounds creepy when you say it like that, but, you know, being really aware of what's going on and people are incredibly hesitant to intervene into the private lives of people's of families. And um, at the meeting this morning, um, I think it might have been Sue Packer, told the story, a dreadful story of how a young boy was wandering about and this man saw this child wandering about and, um, but didn't feel he could go and talk to the child because what someone might think he's a pedophile and the child subsequently fell into a river and drowned. Now there's probably lots of stories about that kids wandering around and people feeling uncomfortable about going up to the child and saying, is everything all right? Or saying to other, just keeping an eye on other adults, children thought, um, uh, that it was really important that other adults needed to be watched and see how children are behaving around those adults. Listening to children and young people and hearing what they're really saying, standing up and speaking out when children and young people are being hurt, bullied or treated badly. There's a pretty strong view from a lot of children and young people that adults stick together. That if you talk about an adult, um, they tend to stick together. Or that, you know, really the child, what would the child know? So they're pretty aware of that. And sometimes it probably doesn't happen, but in their minds, adults stick together. So when um, it's really important, they said, that um, standing up and speaking out for children when they're hurt. Certainly doing what they're supposed to do, doing responding in ways that may be part of the policy or procedures in an institution, uh, following through and doing what they said they were going to do. There was a lot of kids who said, oh, I told so-and-so and he said he was going to do something about it, but I never heard anything else, so I just, you know, didn't say any more. And the last one, which I think is really, really important, which is informing children about what the actual risks are involved in some of these things. It all gets lumped together a bit, you know, with the child abduction and the refugee kids and the, you know, um, uh, the whole sorts of things where they feel unsafe. Um, it's really important, they felt, that kids had a better idea about what really was going on about the dangers. So what really are the dangers and what's being done and, what, um, and how, um, what, how will adults respond if kids need them? 
So, for example, kids didn't know that, I mean, the younger kids were very unaware that, for example, schools had all sorts of policies and procedures for telling people what to do if, they, if something happened. You know, if there was an incident of child abuse or somebody, had been, you know, someone had stolen something or they'd been bullying, they actually weren't really aware that there was this whole set of activities up here that adults had written and involved themselves in and had training about that they didn't even know about. So it's not the danger so much. They just want to know, what are you doing? Tell me the, the real risks here. Don't hide things from me, but don't terrify me either. So if you can get that balance right, you'll be right. <laughs> but also, um, what is being done to try and ensure that these things won't happen? So that was really, I think, a really important message for institutions to, to be able to do quite quickly and quite easily. So what keeps responses from being helpful? Well, there's a lot of barriers children identified about what might keep them from being safe. Um, and they included things like they actually just didn't have anyone to go to. And anyone who knows anything about child sexual abuse is that it is often the vulnerable child without someone keeping an eye on them that might be more vulnerable to any sort of grooming activity or anything else that might happen. That the child or young person doesn't really realise how big an issue it is that they're facing that sometimes they don't um, realise that the bullying is as bad as it is or, it, you know, they, they just aren't as aware um, as they could be. That lots of people who have problems in asking for help or talking to others, that they feel embarrassed and ashamed about asking for help. And even in that video before about that little boy saying, no, no, tell your parents and your teachers because they'll think you're, you know, they'll think you're brave and they'll be proud of you for telling us what happened. They don't know who to talk to. Um, I think these days in schools, I think there's a much better attempt at being in to build in frameworks for pastoral care that people do have, that children don't fall through the gaps as often, but that probably could be strengthened. Um, they are really worried that if they raise something, that the situation will get worse. And that's very common in the bullying behaviour, in the bullying research as well, you know, that they really think if they raise it, that the bullying will get worse. Um, or in this case, that they could be bullied more by an adult because they might have raised some issues. And that they think if um, that an adult in an institution, there could be retribution in some way, whether this is real or not, is what they think. Or they've had very bad responses in the past, either being shushed off or, you know, parents rushing down to schools to, um, you know, on their behalf to, um, you know, um, try and sort something out. This issue about power is really, really important. And um, I don't know why this slide is here, but just as a reminder about the issue of power, um, that adults can do whatever they like and you can't challenge it. Yes, some adults can be on a power trip. Okay, so um, there were also things about adults that stopped children and young people. So those, those other things really were about what stops children and young people. But kids were incredibly aware, and this is not to put a guilt trip on any of you parents here, but they're very aware of how busy people are. They're really aware that their parents are really busy, their teachers are really busy, even their sporting coach who rushes home from, you know, rushes from work down to the sporting field and rushes off again at the end. They're just so aware of the speed and the busyness of people's lives. And hence, they are of the view that um, parents don't really spend um, enough time with their children. They actually feel that quite strongly. Um, in another study, uh, a colleague of mine did about family connectedness. Um, she did a study with 16-year-olds um, about this issue of parental time. And I think a lot of us would think, oh, adolescents, they're not really interested in spending time with their parents. And yet all of them were, even if they didn't want to spend more time, they would like the opportunity to spend more time. So this is a really strong theme, not just in the safety area, but a range of areas where kids are very aware that there just isn't enough time. And if Sue Packer was here, she's of the view, and she might have said it earlier, that she thinks that most people don't like other people's children, they only like their own. And I think that kids um, really pick this up, that in fact there's a lot of people who don't really care very much about children um, or about their concerns. So that's a strong thing. And they don't appreciate sometimes um, to the extent to which the child or young person feels worried or be, you know, or feeling concerned. There's a lot of, oh, just don't worry about it. Look, you know, you'll get over it, all of that sort of talk. Um, 
that adults have other things they need to do and that they can't resolve every issue. Well, I think that's probably true, that, um, you know, there are people who, in, this, in how the, our institutions are formulated, maybe, you know, very low in the pecking order and not have a lot of power to be able to resolve issues. They certainly felt that a lot of adults didn't have, and this is a bit to do with the creepy adult thing as well, they actually were of the view that some adults just do not know how to interact with children, and so they come across as creepy when in fact they may not be, you know, thinking about, they might what? They might, exactly, yeah. And certainly um, there's a whole, they, they pick it up that this interest in skills or authority, um, they feel uncomfortable in talking to children, particularly about difficult issues. I mean, I think, you know, you could say that. I mean, we've run courses on how to have difficult conversations with young people. Workers, too, find it difficult sometimes to have these conversations, never mind a range of others. Um, they believe that the issue is something that's not really any of their business. You know, it's not in their, you know, their response around their, their workplace or their environment. They don't think it's their place to respond. Or even worse, they think somebody else is managing it. Now, when you think about some of the protective, some of the child protection um, training, that idea that you think somebody else is going to deal with it isn't good enough, is it, Naomi? No, it's, it's not good enough. <laughs> so kids, you know, are of the view that they think that sometimes adults think somebody else is managing it, but they're not convinced that this is a particularly good response, and that they don't think it's their role to respond. You know, there's nothing worse, is there? It doesn't matter where you are. If you go to a, you know, reception and you say, "Can you tell me where Blah is?" and they say, "Oh, I don't know." have to go over there and find out you know even at that sort of basic consumer level <laughs> so when children really get that sort of um, poor response when they've got something they're worried about you can imagine it has um, a significant impact on them actually trying to find some help so um, we talked about how organisations can be safe for children and as you'd know there's been quite a lot of work around the safe workplace, the safe community, this is you know, another one really, the safe organisation. But these things were a little bit different and an organisation that's safe to children and young people makes it very clear that their purpose is to help children and young people. Now you can imagine that's quite a broad range of um, institutions that they're there really to help children and young people and they make it obvious. They th children think that's important. That the organisation takes children and young people's safety seriously. Everything from bu bullying to um, the sort of physical things that might happen in playgrounds or, you know, that they're, they're not, um, you know, broken glass and all of those sort of safety things in those child safe cities. The organisation knows who and what things might hurt children and young people and how best to keep them safe. So that's something about the organisation's responsibilities to do some sort of risk assessment about what might be the safety issues in that institution. And that staff talk honestly to children and young people about unsafe people, places and situations and what those adults are doing to keep those children safe. So these are conversations that are had. One of the things that kids spoke a lot about when they were thinking about being unsafe was about unpredictable adults. You know, it, it really does include, I'm afraid, people with mental health issues or people, older people, older young people talked about how little kids think anyone with a tattoo is dangerous or they've got an earring or, you know, that, that the way people look are certainly one of the first ways that people make judgments about who's safe or who's not safe. But also what they also recognised was that anyone that's different to them, very classic sociological response about difference. But, for example, the kids in Queanbeyan said it was the kids in Karamar. <laughs> Is it Karamar? Kar Karabar. Um, the kids who lived in the country, it was the, you know, the annual fruit pickers who came. The Aboriginal kids said it was the white kids. It was like amazing. Everybody had a group um, that, in fact, they were unsafe from. So having those conversations about realistically about what, you know, what's unsafe is important. That staff are available when children and young people need them. That there is some sort of formal, you know, formal capacity in an organisation to ensure that, you know, there is someone for them. Um, when they are unsafe, children are given a say on what should happen and adults act on their needs and wishes and let them know if they can't. This is a really interesting example where kids really um, might raise an issue and they don't want the adult to necessarily problem solve for them or go rushing off to do something, you know, on their behalf, unless, of course, it's absolute danger, you know, like we're talking about, you know, a kid walking in front of a car or something. 
you're not going to stop and negotiate that situation. But when a child comes and says there's something that they've been bullied or there's a worry, um, the instinct is to either... the two seems to be two things that can happen. One, they're dismissed, or two, they overreact. And what kids were saying was, could we not just have a conversation about what I could do? what I would like to do. Would I like you to go and speak on my behalf? Or maybe you could talk to me about the sorts of things I might be able to put in place. And this isn't to say that children should be responsible for their own safety. That is not the message at all. But what they were saying was, why don't you just, you know, listen to us and maybe we do want you to go and rush off on a white horse and save us, but also maybe we can manage this ourselves, particularly the older ones, said we can manage this ourselves. We just need support and perhaps some um, choices about what we might do. So that's, you know, um, for them, adults either responded too strongly or didn't respond strongly enough. So you can't win, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, the organisation values children and young people's feedback, even when it's bad. I think, um, you know, when you think about the consumer movement, children are consumers of services. And I think it is really important that institutions have some mechanism for finding out what children and young people think about the experience they have at school. I know some schools are starting to introduce that sort of feedback slowly um, but in other sorts of institutions as well it would be very useful for them to have a mechanism for finding out um, what children and young people think and they were very very keen for someone like the Royal Commission to come in and check out on how things were going like sort of an outside auditor they were very keen that that might be a very appropriate thing and of course they were pleased to know that in circumstances like juvenile detention centres and residential care they do have things like official visitors where people do come and check but they didn't know that um, and so they were very keen you know the Royal Commission probably could be the group they thought Imagine Justice McClellan going out to your local school to make sure that the policies and procedures are in place. But um, they felt that it was really important that there was other people watching to ensure that things were going, that things were all right. We also asked them what were the important messages for the Royal Commissioners. And the first one is, we shall all be relieved to know, is that most adults are doing well. So that's good. Um, tell them that adults are doing a pretty good job and that most of the time we're safe. And uh, again, remembering, of course, this was a broad range of kids apart from a particular group of kids who, you know, they were just run-of-the-mill kids. They weren't in any high-risk um, environments except for the kids in out-of-home care. Thank the good teachers. It means a lot to us when they listen to us and do stuff we tell them when things are bad. I think they've done everything they can. After that, it's in the young person's hands. Now, this is a very interesting thing about young, the older young people in those focus groups really took on much more responsibility around their own safety and risk-taking than I, as the parent of a, you know, a mid-level adolescent, would like to hear in some ways. So they've got quite a different view about who's responsible at that point. Little kids, yep, definitely adults. You know, 15, 16, 17, they should be making their own way. And I think we, we, that notion of still having that interdependence with young people, I think, is really important. And they are really, really, really strong about the fact that Things aren't as bad as adults believe. Tell them that it's not as bad as they think. Tell them that we can look after ourselves most of the time. The idea that, you know, the parents are absolutely worried about, you know, riding their bikes to school or um, going to the mall or um, the internet. The internet's a really big one. But, but I'm afraid parents and other adults were made a lot of fun of about their incapacity to deal with the internet in quite the efficient way that the young person was. But um, they really feel that, you know, things are not as bad as they are. And um, as I said before, there's some really critical um, messages about um, how the news might become a little bit more child-friendly and a little bit more about how, you know... And this is, a, this is quite a common phenomenon as well, that the really bad things that happen get much more attention than any good things that happen in the news. And I'm not sure, you know, Rupert Murdoch is about to change his news style after 50 years, but children are very, very aware... aware um, they really um, do think that um, there should be a way of having a much more child-friendly um, media. And that the issues that some adults need to develop skills and need to deal with safety concerns more appropriately and have those skills, putting children first. And there's that issue about there should be someone like the Royal Commission who comes in and does a check to make sure that organisations are doing what they say they're going to do. Okay, 
So we've got a little bit of time for some questions in a minute. So we um, would argue that um, adults need to understand how children conceptualise experience and deal with safety issues, that it's not a black and I'm, you know, I'm afraid like lots of researchers, you have to say, well, on the one hand, and it's a balance. And, but I think the important message that children do experience and feel that being safe and feeling safe are two quite different things. Um, that adults need to understand the dynamics of sexual abuse and other safety concerns. I think people have put their head in the sand about what, you know, what um, grooming behaviour is like. They're either too anxious or they're um, probably not um, understanding the dynamics of it in a way. That adults too should help children and young people better understand the dynamics of sexual abuse and safety concerns and how adults and institutions are managing risks. And that there is some attempt to help young people and um, to develop these trustworthy relationships. Um, that's a double-edged sword as well because anyone who knows anything about um, child sexual abuse is it's often someone who is a trusted figure um, who is a perpetrator. So that's a, that's a tricky one. But unless children and young people have a range of trustworthy adults and trustworthy relationships, then they're not going to be able to raise their concerns. And that adults are to take children and young people's concerns more seriously. And I think what makes this study a little bit differently is the incredibly strong call from children and young people about how children and young people should be participating in the planning around keeping um, institutions safe. What do children and young people think might be an effective set of strategies? So that participation call is, um, I think, very, very important. Okay, so what happens next? Well, we've used the findings of this study to develop an online survey and um, uh, that we're hoping that lots and lots of children and young people all over the country through schools and sporting groups and the guides and the scouts and the basketball association and um, will get their support their children and young people to complete the survey. The survey is developed from the findings of the qualitative study, so we're hoping that that'll be very meaningful to children and young people. Um, so I'm going to give you the link in a minute and I'm hoping that you'll write it down and that if you've got children and young people in your life or have connections with anybody that can is um, influential, that those 10 to 18-year-olds can complete the study. So we're going to finish that and uh, that'll close in the middle of October and we'll then talk to our children and young people's reference group to talk through what those findings might mean. And then we write another report to the Royal Commission. The Royal Commission thinks about how what children and young people think fits with what they've heard and then they will make some recommendations based on this study and some other studies. So um, I think it's a real opportunity. So there is our um, survey. So um, I really would be grateful if you, you know, could conjure up some more support. That would be excellent.